Amén. Dios es grande y grandemente será alabado. Amén. Siéntate por favor en la presencia de Dios. Or you may be squatted in American. It is my privilege, my honor to be with you all here today. And um, a good church is hard to find these days. Anyone ever have to go church shopping before? There's a lot of crazy things out there called churches. And if you're here today and you're a guest and you're church shopping, hip and hopping, flipping and flopping, it's time to best be stopping this church is a good church. This is a good church. Man. I've seen a few churches in my days, though my days haven't been long. I'm, I know I look like I'm 12, but I'm 35, old and crunchy. But what I have observed here today is my first time ever here. This is a safe place to bring your family. This is a healthy environment. When churches start growing to this size, they reduce the intimate element and the worship element. And, and this, this church has not lost that whatsoever. What a worshiping church, praying church, and a friendly church. That was the longest guest shake someone's hand break I ever did see in my life. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. And they make pulpits for short people. I want to give honor to the pulpit committee. God bless them with more children. They're beautiful. I'm so happy to be here. I don't know if the Haney family's here, but I give them honor. Uh, my wife has taught every Sister Joy Haney's Women of the Spirit book ever, and there's like a hundred part series or something like that. My wife is in love with that material and teaches it, and Sister Kim Haney's books, we've read them, and uh, there's all these like wrinkled marks. It's like one of our favorite coloring books, you know, you highlight them and you circle them, and, and this is just a, a wonderful church that has wonderful ministry. Give honor to Pastor Haney and the legacy before him. Um, one one or two quick things, and we're going to get into the Word, because you all want to probably go eat something or whatever. I don't know if they have it set up back there, but I brought uh, a little Bible study. I'm a tool kind of person, and I don't know where it's like cameras or something. Is that a camera? Does that thing work pretty good? So you could like zoom in on that if you want. But basically, I, I make full page stickers that you could stick inside of your Bible. You got the bazooka ready? There you go. And so basically, there's, there's four stickers. There's those two. Those two, there you go. If you're wondering why my Bible's so fat, it's because little people are insecure and we carry big things. <laughs> but what it is is uh, there are four stickers you can put inside your Bible. The first one is healthy habits that make healthy Christians. Talks about daily prayer, daily Bible reading, and uh, the importance of attending church faithfully. And then the other three are called what Jesus said about salvation. I'm thankful to be a part of an organization that teaches the Acts 238 message. But what we believe on salvation is not an organization thing. Jesus had something to say about repentance. Jesus had something to say about water baptism. And Jesus had something to say about spirit baptism. And so that's just the practical approach of those stickers. I don't know how many are left. Um, a lot of them went through at these past couple events. But if you're interested, great. If not, you won't hurt my feelings. If you have your Bible... We're going to go in the Old Testament. Testamente viejo. Capítulo 1, versículo 9, por favor. My mom is from Tijuana. Best tacos in the world. Anyone ever been lied to before? Three biggest lies I ever heard in my life came from my Mexican mama. First biggest lie she told me was, Mijo! That means my son, you will grow. <laughs> Second biggest lie my Mexican mama told me is, mijo, your pimples will go away. 
34, 35 years old, and I still wake up sometimes looking like Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. And the third biggest lie my Mexican mama told me is, mijo, you will overcome the fear of public speaking. So I'm thankful for a solid pulpit so you cannot see what my knees are doing right now <laughs> and the messes that I'm making. The book of Isaiah chapter 1. You have a picture of my family? I like my family a little bit, a lot of bit. I'm kind of obsessed with them. Nope. All right. It's all right. If you Ah, oh, there they are. Yeah. I love... I love my family. It's my wife, Jordan. We've been married 15 years. We got married when we were 12. And those are my three children, Noah, Grace, and Eden. As you can tell, we're still in the book of Genesis. Our next kid will be Nimrod or Methuselah. I love them very, very, very much. And my son is with me somewhere. Or maybe, ah, there he is. I love my boy. He's a powerful powerful man of God. Isaiah chapter 1 and verse 9. Now I'm going to ruin your Sunday morning if that's okay. Um, we're going to have a Bible study. So I know that we hate Bible studies because we got to go through the Word and got to actually use the Bible and actually read it. I know it's awful. And you know, like the popular thing is like, you know, you open up with one text, one verse, and then, like, you don't use any other verses the rest of the sermon. And the verse you open with has nothing to do with what you're even preaching about anyways. I like going through the Word. Verse 9. Except the Lord of hosts had left unto us a very small remnant, we should have been like Sodom. We should have been like Gomorrah, these wicked, vile twin cities God is referring to. So hear the word of the Lord, rulers of Sodom. Give ear unto the law of our God, ye people of Gomorrah. To what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices unto me, says the Lord? I've had enough of all your worship services. I've had enough of all your sacrifices. Verse 12, when you come and appear before me at designated times and services, Who's required this at your hand to tread my courts? Stop bringing these empty worship sets, verse 13. Stop going and having all these conferences and these conventions and these camps, these assemblies. You all okay? I mean, it's just the Bible. It's just the Bible. Verse 14, he says, When you have your new moons, your appointed feast, my soul hates. It's a trouble to me. I am weary to bear them. You spread forth your hands, I'll hide my eyes from you. You make many prayers, someone say many prayers. I'm not going to listen to them. This is God talking here. And here we are, you know, trying to promote more church and more prayer. And then God catches us off, our, off guard and he says, uh-uh. So he says, wash you, make clean, put away the evil of your doings from before my eyes. Cease to do evil. Learn to do well. Seek judgment. There's two words we could talk about for a while. 2019. Judge not, judge not, judge not. It gets quiet sometimes. The Bible says, seek judgment. Look, I'd rather be judged on this side of eternity than on the wrong side of eternity. I already told you, this is going to be a boring day. It's just Bible study. It's just the Word of God, so just get your pillow out. We go on reading in this verse. He says, Relieve the oppressed, judge the fatherless, plead for the widow. Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Your sins are as scarlet, but they will be white as snow. Your sins are red like crimson. They shall be as wool. 
Wow. I want to talk to us for the next couple moments today about vile prayers. Turn to your neighbor and say, vile prayers. Turn to your other neighbor, poke him in the eye, tell him we walk by faith, not by sight. Gave me this baby water. <laughs> little people and little water. Probably some like formula in there. <laughs> Is it all right to smile in church? You all okay? I'm a little nervous. There's more people in this room than there is the state of South Dakota. <laughs> Vile prayers. It's kind of interesting to me that when you read throughout the word of the Lord, there's this continual emphasis on prayer. There is this push to have a relationship with God. There is this push to have communication with the Lord. We are to be talking to him. The illustration is a, a, a groom and a bride, the church and the living God, this relationship that God wants to have with his people. I'm so thankful that we are aware that there is an all-powerful God, but he's not just some distant, all-powerful God. He is a personal God. He wants to engage us. He wants to interact with us. He wants to commune with us. He wants to talk with us. Isn't that an awesome God? But at the same time, God has some things to say about communication. A husband and a wife could have communication, a relationship, but doesn't mean the relationship or the communication is healthy. You might have talked to your wife today, but maybe the only thing you said was, make me a sandwich. That's not a good relationship. <laughs> In fact, I don't know how much longer your relationship is going to last. Just because you're talking or in the proximity does not mean things are well. And so God says to the people, your prayers are vile. They are wicked. They are corrupt. There is something wrong with the way you are talking to me. We ought not to be arrogant, haughty, and prideful and begin to think that anything that we do, that God is obligated to receive it. Mark chapter 7 and verse 7 says, How be it in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. This is Jesus talking. He says, You are worshiping me, but it means nothing to me because you're doing it your way instead of God's way. That's in your Bible. We got to make sure what we do, that it's not just acceptable to our personality and our own lifestyle, but that it is holy and acceptable unto God, which is our reasonable service. Some prayers are vile and God gives no heed to them. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 28 and verse 9, the person that turns away their ear from hearing the law of God. Even that person's prayer is an abomination. If you're wondering why your prayers don't seem to be working, are you obeying the word of God? You all okay? James chapter 3 and verse 3 says, We ask and receive not because we ask amiss that we may consume it upon our own lust." Just because you ask God about something doesn't mean what you are asking is appropriate or right. Our motive matters when we pray. Because vile prayers, wicked prayers, corrupt prayers are ineffective prayers. Can I be personal with you for a moment? No? Okay, I'll do it anyway. Now, when I haven't always lived for God, and... Uh, there's, there's any, if I share a weird story, it's, it's one of those moments. But there was a service I was in, and it was a powerful service. The man of God was preaching, and he began to speak under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, saying, whatever you pray, God is going to answer it today. 
God's going to do it. And faith was so high in the atmosphere, and as carnal, as wicked, evil as I was, I, I did have a prayer request. And I ran to that altar, and I threw my hands in the air, and I went to town. I went after it. And the church is going crazy because here's this, this little evil man praying. And so they all gather around, you know, the 20 to 1 ratio prayer. And, and they're, they're praying for me. They're sweating. They're spitting. All this kind of jazz going on. And, and, and finally, I wear out the saints of the Most High. They, they're flat worn out. They stop praying. It's been, I don't know how long it went, but it was longer than normal. And I was just going, God, I was desperate. I was crying out to him. And the people began to trickle out, and I stood there, travailing before the Lord, believing with all my heart he was going to answer my prayer. You want to know what my prayer was? God, I just want to be tall. Please, I believe. I wish I could tell you I'm making this story up. And I wish I could tell you I was nine years old. But it's none of your business how old I was when I prayed that prayer. Is we'll try to catch God in the corner. You say whatever I ask for, I'm going to get it. But there's vile prayers. You praying to get your Escalade with spinning rims and subwoofers. Not even tithing. Well, you're going to find out real fast. I'm the kind of preacher you either hate or you despise. There are vile prayers God does not bless. If you wake up in the morning, you go to make a bowl of cereal, and it's Rice Krispie cereal, and you pray, God's not going to bless Rice Krispie cereal. It's just a, a, a tinkling sound. It's just a brass cymbal. It's a snap, crackle, pop. There are but if it's Cinnamon Toast Crunch, that's different. The Lord blesses that. You ever, you, you all know what we do usually when church is over, a conference or something like that is over. What do we do? We go eat. That's what, that, that's, that's like your right to passage into Pentecost almost. You learn to eat after every prayer. But we go to the restaurant and we pray this prayer. You, you go to something like McDonald's and, and you order your Big Mac and you say, Lord, I pray you. Bless this Big Mac to the nourishment of my body. Lord, I pray you reduce the calories, increase the protein, Lord. And I pray it goes straight to my biceps right now. Reduce my waistline. I pray in the precious name that is above every name. Look, God does not bless McDonald's. He made Chick-fil-A. <laughs> feel like I'm ministering to somebody here today. You understand the point, though. There's just some things that God's not going to do for you. God's simply not going to answer those prayers because they are vile. They are corrupt they are shallow though they are low level prayers me asking to be tall that is a selfish prayer with impure motives and wrong intentions but i don't believe our problem in america today is james chapter 4 and verse 3 i believe the more common problem i have discovered is the prior verse in verse 2 we have not because we ask not. We know the old adage, a cliche, where there is much prayer, there is much power. Where there is little prayer, there is little power. And where there is no prayer, see, the prayerful are the powerful. Everyone would like to be powerful, but very few people are living a life that is prayerful. 
We get mad at God, you know, because sometimes things don't seem to be turning out the way we would like them to turn out. We don't talk to them very often, more infrequent, if at all. And then all of a sudden, we are upon a moment of chaos and there is a loss in our family or there is a, a, a diagnosis in the family and we get worked over with emotion and, and we get angry and we get upset because we've heard all these positive things about God and what he can do but our situation in the present may not be so positive and so we clench our fists we look at the sky and we cry out God where are you and God looks back down and says, where have you been? We have not because we ask not. Someone say prayer. prayer. Now, I know this is a boring subject, and this is not the subject a guest preacher is supposed to go through. I'm supposed to preach about revival, and let's all jump, and let's do some fist pumping here, and let's just have a good time. But I am not here to work up a frenzy. I'm not here to build hype. I'm giving a message that will give you hope, that you will see that which you're hoping for, that which you are wanting. See, I, I love praise. I love worship. I love to dance before the Lord with all my might. But see, praise can help you gain ground, but only prayer will help you sustain ground. You've got to be a man, a woman of prayer. Praise can defeat the enemy, but your prayer will protect what you took from the enemy. Mark chapter 1 verse 35 says, And in the morning, a great while before the day, he went out and departed into a solitary place. Who's that talking about? Jesus. Jesus, who we try to bear his name, calling ourselves Christian, Christ-like. He was a man of prayer. Now, there's different reasons and views and explanations as to why Jesus was a person that prayed. I've heard it so many times that he prayed for our example that is true but not all the truth there is to it jesus prayed because he had to the bible says in the book of hebrews chapter 4 and verse 15 that we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities but was in all points tempted like as we are but without sin in the book of Matthew chapter 4 and verse 1, the Bible says that Jesus went to be tempted of the devil. Jesus was sinless. His flesh was sinless. He prayed because he had to. Because he battled temptation. Now think about this. Jesus with sinless flesh only defeated it through prayer. Who are we with sinful flesh to think that we'll win the battle without prayer? If you are being tempted, and even if you're not being tempted, you still got your flesh in temptation. It is lying. It is crouching at the door. It is waiting for you. This is why we must be people of prayer. Matthew chapter 26, verse 40 and 41. The Bible says when Jesus was praying in the garden with the disciples, he turned and he looked his followers fast asleep. And he woke them up and he said, What? Could you not pray with me for one hour? The Greek word for one hour is 60 minutes. I'll, I'll let Revelation, it's slowly moving. Sixty minutes then is sixty minutes now, and you think Jesus like, oh, you poor little guy, you you just so tired. I understand, yeah. Uh-uh. What? Don't you sense the hour that you're living in, the proximity that's lying at the door? It's not time to coddle the flesh. 
and to cave into the flesh. It's time to crucify. Someone shout prayer. See, prayer is powerful. Jesus, he explained why they needed to have extended time. Because there's some temptations you're not going to win in the battle with 10-minute prayer. There's some temptations and wars you're not going to win by your little five-minute-a-day prayer. It might sound good, might make you feel good, but there's some temptations. It's extended time to win the battle. He says, watch and pray. That you enter not into temptation. See, your spirit is willing, but your flesh is weak. Therefore, pray. If you want to overcome that lust that you have, those sexual thoughts that you are having, that self-gratification you're caving into, you want to overcome that battle with pornography, you want to overcome your situation where your marriage is in shambles, you want to see your kids come back through, you want to see someone stand up for it, you're going to find somebody that is given to prayer. Does, does anyone believe prayer is powerful? Does anyone believe that prayer can cast down strongholds? Does anyone believe that prayer can raise the dead? That prayer can heal the sick? That prayer can deliver someone possessed with the devil? Does anyone believe the power of prayer? Someone shout prayer! Here's what I learned. I'm young. I, I'm young and dumb. I understand that. So you can just write me off if you want. That's I'm just passing through. But in the short little slot of time I had of living this life, and namely this past five years that my wife and I have, this open door has come upon us where we travel across the country. God has challenged me to take a pulse of the devotional life, the consecration life of our movement. Surveyed over 10,000 people. And here's what I've learned about prayer. Prayer is the most respected, but the most neglected. Everybody says, yeah, prayer. Prayer's awesome. Prayer works. Prayer's powerful. Now, me, this is, this is how I pastor back home. When I talk to people, I, I just kind of get in their business. Not like just random business, like particular things. It's prayer. I go, D are you praying? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Are you praying every day? Bub. Kind of. Oh. Or even if they say, yeah. How long do you pray in a single setting daily? Uh, uh, what time do you pray? Uh, uh, uh. And here's what I've learned serving. And if we had time and all that stuff and the resource, we would do it here. Over 40% of people, this is when we did a, a, a digital survey, 40% of people do not pray daily in our movement. I'm not talking about some other movement, our movement. Now, when I do it where it's a smaller setting and, and you can make everybody participate because they don't have to opt out about filling out on their phone, and you actually raise your hand if you're praying daily, and you ask them how much they're praying, it's closer to 70% of people are not praying daily in those settings. And those that are praying, the average time is around 15 to 18 minutes. And only less than 3% of people in our movement pray an hour or more. Think about that. I'll just throw another one. Less than 25% are reading through their Bible in a year. Our movement. And we wonder why we're so frustrated. We wonder why we're in this vicious cycle of the flesh and sin. We wonder why. Look, the problem is not with God. The problem is not with the power of His Spirit. But see, if we ever learn to walk in the Spirit, and the only way you can do that is to be a person of prayer. Paul said in the book of Galatians chapter 5, verse 16 and 17, This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the Spirit, the Spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary one to the other so that you cannot do the things that you would 
See, you want to cast out devils. You want to walk in victory. You want to see your family saved. You want to make it to heaven. But you're wondering why you're stumbling and you're hitting a wall. We have not because we ask not. We are in the dawn of a new age. It is an age that struggles in prayer. You all are in California. You probably are aware of this, about the Azusa Street Revival. There are three prophecies that went forth towards the closing end of the Azusa Street Revival. And I'll just name one of them. It's talking about before Jesus comes back, this will be the condition of my people. And he said this, a generation that praises a God to whom they do not pray to. If there's ever been a generation that's a dancing generation, a praising generation, it is this generation. But as I have found out, it is a generation that is high on praise and low on prayer. Would you lift your hands for a moment? Would you ask God to help us not get offended today? Come on, would you ask God to speak to your spirit? There's a challenge that's going to go forth today. And God is about to pour out of his spirit. Would you clap your hands to the Lord? It's 11.06. What, are we okay? You all right? No, you, 11.06 okay? I, I, I do respect time, believe it or not. Now, now hear me. Now prayer... What I have learned about prayer in in our movement, people that have been coming to church and people that haven't, we don't know how to pray. Now, I'm probably preaching this to the wrong crowd because this is a praying church. I mean, there's, there's sheets all over this place about signing up, and there's a 24-hour prayer chain going. So I'm, I'm probably preaching to the wrong church. But there's probably a handful of people I, I just, I want to help you. All right, just, just that handful. And so those that are praying, just as much support as possible, okay? But Luke 11, 1 says, Lord, teach us to pray. Don't feel stupid because you don't know how to pray. We all start there. you got to learn how to pray. If you got your pen and paper, I want you to take that out. If you got a phone and you're going to actually take notes and not send text messages, you can pull that out. We're good at the power of Pentecost. We're not so good at the practical side of Pentecost. I like to give instruction, not just inspiration, but application, what we need to do. Is that that all right? Can I just teach here? Let me just give you a few things that you need to do. To be successful tomorrow, you got to plan today. So here's what you do. Pick the time that you're going to pray tomorrow. Pick the place that you're going to pray tomorrow. If you do not have a designated time, and if you do not have a designated place, the likelihood of you being successful has been greatly reduced. Okay, I'm not being mean. I'm trying to just help you understand why you might not be successful on a daily basis. Pick a time and pick a place. Is that all right? Now, my recommendation is kind of do what Jesus did, early morning prayer. I like to get up before the sun gets up. That's kind of a lie, because I hate to get up. Before the sun gets up. Hate it. But I've learned the benefit of it. The discipline. And here, here's one of the things I, I, I talk to God when I get up in the morning. I say, God, the only reason I am up right now is because I want to greet you. It's the only reason I'm up, Jesus. And I, something comes over my spirit when I make that statement. I'm only up for you, Jesus. In other words, I would rather sleep to the crack of noon. I treat my prayer like I treat my finances. If you don't know this, financially, whatever comes your way, the first thing you do is give 10% to God. Well, that's an Old Testament concept. Well, read Matthew 23, 23 and just stop it. Jesus said, look, we, 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 you, you guys are focusing on a judgment and, and, and all this kind of stuff. You tithe of mint, cumin, and anise, but you've omitted the weightier matters of the law, judgment, faith, and mercy. And he says, these ought ye to have done and not leave the other undone. Jesus says, it's not either or, it's both and. 
That's New Testament Jesus talking. Anyways, we're in this not tithing lesson today. But see what happens, the re there's many reasons why tithing has been set in place in your Bible. Many reasons. But here's one of them. There is an immediate competition for your finance the moment you get it. The moment you get it, your tire goes flat. The moment you get it, your cell phone bill came in. And your rotten little brats exceeded your data. I'm sorry. sorry. And all of a sudden you got to pay this. All of a sudden you got a, a hospital visit. But see, now there's this pressure. I don't have enough and so I got to take care of this. But God says, trust me. Prove me and put me first. And the, the sooner you just immediately give that 10% to God, then you're, that pressure is off of you. And you're saying, God, I trusted you. And here's what I have left. And God will bless it. The moment you wake up, there is an immediate competition for your time. Immediately. All of a sudden, you got to get to work. All of a sudden, you got to make the, the, the lunch for your kids going to school. All of a sudden, you got to hurry up and do this. Oh, my goodness, the dog. The dog got into the trash. There's an immediate rush in a, for, or a competition for your time. So here's what I've learned to do. Get up before the competition. Get up before the competition. And give God the first part of your day. Now, you may say, well, I got, it's not the best because I, I pray awful in the morning. It doesn't matter. Just give him the first. You can pray your best later in the day if you have to. But when I pray in the morning, it's preparatory prayer. I am praying the armor of God upon me, upon my children, upon my family. I'm not really interceding for the needs of everything in the community. I'm not praying about every single situation in the church. I'm praying for me and my family in the morning and the direction of the course that is set before me for the next few hours of the day. You don't see, you know, I, I'm not advocating for sports. I'm just using an illustration if you understand, okay? You don't see some, some, uh, some football player, I don't know, uh, the, the name of quarterback. Russell Wilson? Russell Wilson. is that basketball? I don't know. Russell Wilson, whoever this guy is. And so you don't see this guy all of a sudden, oh, my goodness, it's offense turn. I'm coming. He's already suited up and ready to step onto the field. When your doors open to your apartment, your house, wherever you live, you are not stepping onto a cruise ship. You're walking out onto a battleship. There is a war raging outside the doors of your home. And the best way to win the war is to be suited up with the armor of God. Uh, that makes sense? All right. A couple other tips. You are, are you still taking notes? A couple tips. I'm just trying to help you out. That's all. I'm not here mad. I'm not bent out of shape. I'm not preaching a sermon to get invited back. I'm just here to deal with a reality. All right? Now, here we go. Next thing is this. Do not have any devices in the room you're going to pray in. No phone, no iPad, no laptop, none of it. It's distraction. People praying, they got their phone, Lord God, yes, Lord God, yes, Lord God, amen, amen, Lord God, Lord God, amen. No, remove the distraction. Next thing, to be able to focus, talk out loud. Because if you are a silent person and you're just, dude, Christ. I know I'm in California, I know. Dude, bro, Father God. Your mind's going to wander. Speak out loud, and you stay on point. Even if you're a quiet person, you don't like to talk out loud, and I don't have time to go through this, but there is this biblical precedent to the power of your voice. Proverbs 18, 21, death and life are in the power of the tongue. There's creative power and destructive power in your voice. And so you want life for your day? Speak life. You want to tear down things of the kingdom of the prince of the power of the air? Speak against it. That makes sense? So speak out. Next, set some goals. Try to increase the amount of time you pray. If you're praying 10 minutes, I'm not here insulting you. 
I'm here trying to encourage you to extend your time with God. And if you want to try to, try to get to that place where you're incrementally making up to 30 minutes a day, and I'm telling you, your world will change if you're praying 30 minutes a day every single day. And then once you get into that stride, begin to develop it. Don't stop. Keep moving forward. And you'll find yourself praying. I'm talking about in a single setting. There's this, there's this new thing going on. Maybe it's probably not new, but it's, it's resurfaced. Is this, you know, people, are, oh, yeah, I, I, I pray an hour a day. I, uh, I prayed five minutes here, then 30 seconds over my cereal, and then you carry over the two, multiply by five, and then you see I, I pray when I was in my car, Jesus, take the wheel, and I, there's a, yeah, I think I prayed an hour. I'm not against praying as you're walking and going and all that kind of stuff. But it's not the same as in just park. Look, I could talk to my wife throughout the day, passing through the home, talk, you know, here and there over the phone. Hey, baby. Yeah, yeah hey, you got the kids? Okay, I'll get the kids. Yeah, I'll take care of that. All right, all right. That's not the same as me sitting down. How's your day, babe? Oh, yeah? What's going on? Okay, let's. We'll work on that, okay? That's different. That's intimate. That's personal. And you can have more meaningful conversations, goal setting, accomplishments, accomplishments, plannings, projections in a single setting that's undivided and personal. That's the opportunity you have when you pray. You can actually put your phone out of the room. You could get up before your kids get up so you can focus a little bit. You can get up early before school or your job and you can actually not be in a rush. That's the beauty of creating a sacred slot of time that belongs to nobody but God. And you don't feel in a panic and a rush. You can let your mind engage the spirit. You can let your heart engage God because you don't feel rushed. The reason why prayer is a drag to you is because you're always in a rush. Let's lift our hands. I'm hurrying up. God's going to move here. Can you lift your voice for a moment and say, Jesus, teach me to pray. Teach me to pray. Teach me to pray, Jesus. Teach me to pray, Jesus. Huh. I got to hurry up. Proverbs chapter 15, verse 8, the sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord, but the prayer of upright is his delight. Vile prayers. I take us to the book of Revelation chapter 5. There's a lot more I want to say about prayer, but I, 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 I've been going longer than I thought. Revelation chapter 5, verse 8. Man, the Holy Ghost is here. He had taken the book. This is a glimpse of a prophetic scene in heaven. And the Bible says the four beasts, the 420 elders, fell down before the Lamb. And each of them had harps and they had golden vials. Someone say vials. Full of odors, which are the prayers of the saints. There was a frustration because here was this beautiful book that everyone wanted opened. But it was sealed, and no one could open it. But all of a sudden, the Lamb came forth. And the Bible says that there was in heaven these golden vials before the throne of God that were filled with the prayers of the saints. See, there are vile prayers that don't get through to God. But then there are prayers that make it into these vials before God. These vials, these vile prayers fill up the bowl held in the hands of the angels of the Lord and they offer a sweet incense before God. And these prayers initiate the end time events. The Lamb steps forth to open the first seal of prophecy. There are prayers that can pierce through the canopies of darkness over this area. There are prayers that can pierce through the outer stratospheres of the heavens and they can deposit into the vials before the throne room of God. I'm talking about vile prayers today. I don't have time to go through some scripture that I would really like to go through today, but let me throw a couple things out there. 
that God gives these two illustrations in the word of the Lord in Luke chapter 11 and Luke chapter 18 concerning prayer. They ask, teach us to pray. And he gives the illustration of a, a man of importunity. Somebody that kept knocking on the door until they got what they needed. And that was the illustration that Jesus used when it came to teaching us to pray. He taught us to be just completely unashamed to be just rash and crazy and persistent before the presence of God about a particular need. See, there's this thing right now where people are saying, well, you know, I don't want to keep bothering God with the same thing. He already he already knows about it. I've already told him. It's, I've committed it to him. I'm just going to move on. But when Jesus was trying to teach us to pray, he says, keep at it. Keep praying for the exact same thing over and over and over. See, it doesn't take faith to get it the first time every time. Real faith is I'm going to keep coming whether I feel he's going to answer it or not in this moment. I'm going to keep coming because I know ultimately he will. That's called faithful prayer. And that is a faith-filled prayer. That kind of prayer goes into jars in heaven. That kind of prayer goes into the vials before the throne room of God. Luke 18, he says, men ought always to pray and not faint. And then he goes on about that wicked king and that importunate widow that keep, kept coming before the king to ask for her request to be made. And he flat wore, or she flat wore out that king and got the request. You read it in your Bible, I don't have time. But here's the deal. Jesus said this about that woman. He says, when the Son of Man returns to this earth, will he find that kind of faith on the earth? Jesus said, I'm concerned before I return back for my church if I'm going to find persistent prayer warriors that pray and petition about the same thing over and over and over again. Would you clap your hands to the Lord? <laughs> Revelation chapter 8 verse 1. I'm going to hurry up to a close. You all are falling asleep and I'm sorry. He opened up the seventh seal. There was a silence in heaven about the space of a half hour. And I saw the seven angels which stood before God. And to them were given seven trumpets. Another angel came and stood at the altar having a golden censer. And there was given unto him much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of all saints upon the golden altar which was before the throne of God. The smoke of the incense which came up before with the prayers of the saints ascended up before God. In chapter 5, the first seal was opened. In chapter 8, the last seal is being opened. And in verse 4, we just read the last time prayer is mentioned in your Bible. Last time prayer will happen in the last days. I ask you, church, will you be found praying that day? We are living on the prayers of the pillars. If you're here, you're a CLC student, or you go to the academy here, K through 12, you're a teenager in a youth group, I want you to line up here as fast as you can. Maybe just about 50. It doesn't need to be a lot. Maybe just 50 line up in case you're... If you're falling asleep, this might help you wake up. A straight line, a straight line facing me, going out that way. Let's start right here, right here. So all of you there, over there, por favor, muchas gracias, de nada. I don't know, my English is probably bad. A straight line. <laughs> this must be the homeschool group. I... <laughs> my kids are homeschooled. Relax. They don't know math either. 
so thankful that God made it 10%. It makes it a lot easier. Y'all all right? Man, a straight line. If a straight line, uh, like half of you can maybe go back to your seats. That's all right. You're not going to hurt my feelings. If I need a straight line. Like this, this is congestion. This is like L.A. traffic. <laughs> Let's make this more like South Dakota. Let's clear it up. Open skies. Siéntete, por favor. I just need a straight line, about 50 people. <laughs> this is epic. <laughs> See, now everyone's coming out of their deathly slumber. This is how the Lord uses things to wake people up. My volunteer, where's my volunteer at? Is there a volunteer that's going to help me out? Come on over here, my friend. This is my last effort. The line starts right here. So anything beyond, behind me, over here. Or you could sit down. It will, you're not in trouble if you sit down. You're really not. It's not a rebuke. You can have a seat. What this point I want to illustrate to you represents, this is what God had in mind since the book of Genesis, since the beginning. This is what God has predestined. This is what God planned. This is what God has wanted. It's what our elders, our forefathers that were in the vein of the Holy Ghost reach for and strive for this moment right here. This represents the jar that is set in heaven. Vile prayers. And what begins to happen here, this first group is going to represent all those that have gone before us, that have fought the good fight of faith, that have finished their course, that had a moment where they knew the power of prayer and they found a place with God and they got that prayer and they saw what God wanted, and they prayed for that, and that vile prayer made it into that throne room before God. And so what I want each of you to do as I begin to talk here in just a moment, I want you to represent the pillars that have gone before, and to just slowly grab one cup and dip in and pour into that, and then you can go have a seat, okay? You understand? Does everyone back there hear that? All right, we're good. And so as we begin this, I want you to grab a cup and I want you to begin to make it towards that vile jar that fills the, before the throne of God. What they begin to represent right now is the prayers of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They were given a promise and God told them of a land and they went not knowing where they were going. They just knew that there was a city whose builder and maker was God and they would pray and they were the father of the faithful. This group represents Moses, Aaron, and Joshua. Moses who did not give in to the pleasures of Egypt and sin for a season. He wanted to suffer and be afflicted with the people of God. People like Joshua and Samuel, even in dark hours in the dark ages, God always had a prophet. God always had a man or a woman that still went to prayer. There were vile prayers out there, but there was always someone making a vile prayer in the darkest of hours. Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Peter, James, and John, they filled that jar. They made prayers before the Lord. We went into the period of the 21st century people like Parham, Seymour, G.T. Haywood, O.R. Foss, Verbal Bean, Nona Freeman, Billy Cole, Benny DeMerchant, N.A. Urshan, Andrew Urshan, Merle Ewing, G.A. Mangan, J.T. Pugh, James Kill.
Kilgore, T.W. Barnes, C.M. Becton, C.G. Weeks, someone named Clyde Haney, a man named Kenneth Haney, and currently your bishop, Nathaniel Haney. This has been going on for generations. I want you to stop this moment. Can we lift our hands? Church, we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. I know you might feel alone, but we are entering into fields in which we have bestowed no labor. I'm telling you, the prayers of the saints have been accumulating for millennia. They have been accumulating for generations. They have been compiling decade after decade, century after century. They have been making vile prayers. Listen to me very carefully, young generation. We are the most blessed and most privileged generation. That jar over there, filled of giant killers like David, but you are the Solomon generation. But we don't need to make the same mistake that Solomon made. We can learn from his mistakes. We have been given all the supplies we have been given all the materials. Our forefathers have blessed us. God forbid there's anyone in this room that is complaining about this church. You are blessed. This church didn't start in pews. This church didn't start in air conditioning. This church didn't start with this technology. This church didn't start with such nice pulpits and sound systems. We are the most blessed group of people on this side of eternity. We have been so blessed. I'm looking at your age group and I'm not being rude to you. I'm not being disrespectful. But your age group prays so little. This age group is sacrificing so little. And parents, I'm not talking about a Pharaoh now, let my people go. Parents, let God's children go. Stop trying to coddle them. Teach them how to sacrifice and learn how to sacrifice. And why don't you lead it by example? We want this generation to pray. Do they ever hear their mom and dad pray on a daily basis? Do they ever see their mom or their dad read the Bible in the home? Or is it just a family time around another TV show? I'm telling you right now, we want this generation to sacrifice. We must sacrifice. Adults, I love you, but we got to stop pointing the finger at them and saying, Man, this generation doesn't understand how to sacrifice. You're raising them. You are raising them. Those are your kids. You want your kid to be a worshiper? Be a worshiper. You want your child to read the Bible? Read your Bible with your child. Don't expect pastor and ministry team to do all the work. You are the priest of your home. You are the gatekeeper of your home. They need to hear grandma and grandpa pray. They need to hear their father, their mother. Their Hear me. 
God is about to explode in this place. Hear me. We are blessed. We are blessed. But I don't want to be a generation that just inherits. I want to invest. Young adults, college students, teens, children, let's invest, not just inherit. I believe I'm talking to a group right now that you can start praying. You're not too young to not pray. I'm telling you, these young people will rise to the level of expectation. Oh, I don't think my kid can pay an hour. Well, does your kid play a video game for an hour? Oh, he has ADHD, LMNOP. I'll believe the diagnosis if he can't watch a movie for two hours. Our problem has never been attention. It's always been appetite. That what we have an appetite for, we will give attention to. Are you all ready to invest? You all ready to invest? You are so blessed and privileged right now by generations of sacrifice. Every piece of property you're touching right now, sacrifice, sacrifice, sacrifice. Right now, God wants to see, are you gonna sacrifice? Are you gonna start having some vile prayers? Are you gonna start pouring into this jar? If you're going to make up your mind to start investing, I want this generation right now to start pouring into that jar. I want you to start investing right now. Would you begin to fill that jar right now? God, I'm not just going to sit on the pew and watch pastor sacrifice. I'm going to fast a little bit. I'm not just going to watch my Sunday school teacher sacrifice. I'm going to start doing it. I might be nine years old, but I'm going to be hell's worst nightmare as a nine year old. I might be 13 years old, but I'm about to operate in the gifts of the spirit. I might only be 15, 18, 22, but I'm telling you I've been a given a handout long enough. I'm going to get my hand in it. I'm going to pour into it. I'm I'm going to add my prayers to the prayers of the saints. I'm going to add my prayers to the elders that have gone before. Can you? You may not be able to see it from your vantage point. I don't know, maybe if a cameraman can help out. But we're at a point where the water exceeds the container. It's what you call surface tension or the tipping point. One more drop added to this and it runs over. Are you with me, church? This is not where we want to stop. This, prophetically, is where you are. And the devil, you want to know why early morning prayers are getting harder for you? I'm talking even to the prayer warriors in this house. There's a spirit of slumber attacking you. Well, I, I don't know. I'm just not feeling God. Why do you think the enemy is attacking the prayer warriors? Why do you think the enemy is trying to cause us to write off prayer? Because he can see where we're at on the timeline of God's table. And the enemy knows he has but such a short season. Young man, come here. I don't know who you are. I know nothing about you, but that does not matter. All that matters is that you are known in heaven. 
You don't need to be known on earth. Don't get in a big fuss if you never get to stand in this pulpit, if you never get asked to preach an event, if you never get asked to preach a conference, if you're never going to be the lead singer. Don't ever let that bother you. We all can't have those same opportunities or moments, but every single one of us can pray. Every single one of us can serve. Every single one of us can worship. And look, I believe with all my heart that there is going to be someone on the last day before the last trump sounds and that trump is going to sound and there's going to be a voice of the archangel and there's going to be a mighty blow of that trumpet and the dead and Christ are going to and on that last day I just wonder who's going to pray the last prayer who's going to be the one that brings the last prayer to the throne room of God and God says it's time it's time this cup is running over it's time to put the scripture goes on to say in Revelation 8 in verse 5 and I'm done I'm wrapping it up the angel took the censer he filled it with the fire of the altar and he finally cast it into the earth there were voices thunderings lightnings and the earth began to shake see the angels are preparing themselves to sound parents prayers never die pastor prayer never dies elders prayers never die young people you may feel like your prayers are all alone but they're not your prayers have been joined with Kenneth Haney your prayers have been joined with Clyde Haney your prayers have been joined with CG Weeks your prayers have been joined with Lee Stone King your prayers have been joined with Josh Herring your prayers have been joined with thousands yay millions that have prayed before you go ahead and kneel down And that which this church has been praying for. I don't even know how old this church is. But you all are a legacy church. You're a strategic church. You're a lighthouse. You're a banner. People watch you, whether you know it or not. And what is you are going to represent is going to have an outflow, an overflow. It's not just going to be Stockton, but it's going to flow out of Stockton. It's going to impact regions. It's going to, it's, the flow is going to move across oceans. The flow is going to move across this world. And I, you may not feel like you have much value, but if you could ever learn the value of your prayer, you might be the unknown lad in the room but you go ahead and add your prayer to that it's running over and that day that day when it runs over You're going to wake up like you did every other 5 a.m. Wiping the stuff out of your eyes, clothes wrinkled, bad breath. You don't feel a single thing. But it's going to be a prayer, just like you prayed every single prayer. But see, this prayer is the tipping point. You've been praying for your daughter. You've been praying for your family. You've been praying for your husband. It doesn't seem like much. It's been years you've been praying. But I'm telling you, it's tipping point time. And all of a sudden, Come on, church. It's not time to stop praying for your lost family. It's not time to stop praying for the prodigals. You prayed prodigal prayers for years, but I'm telling you right now in the Holy Ghost, you're about to walk and see the prayer you've been praying for decades. You're going to see the prayer you've been praying for Stockton over...
I was a lost, backslidden, prodigal child. I was so gone. My parents, years later, my mom, years later, my dad shared something with me, and it absolutely broke me. I'm, I'm even embarrassed to mention it to you. I was vehemently against the church as a teenager. I did everything I could to cause discord, disunity, and begin to affect everything I could possibly in the church. There was a wicked, vile spirit that was upon me. I would sneak out of the house. I would go to the clubs in the south side of Chicago. I would come back home at 4 a.m. And then I went back in the house. I would hear my Mexican mama, oh, Jesus, save my boy. We'd be having dinner. Mom would get the dishes, and she would go and start washing the dishes. And all of a sudden, oh. She starts travailing as she washes the dishes and pray for the salvation of her boy. Sometimes I lay my head down 10 o'clock at night. I would wake up to the sound around 11 or 12. Ah, God save my boy. My brother was at Bible College, at Indiana Bible College, and the spirit came upon him. My brother excused himself from class, and he hid inside of an elevator shaft, and he began to intercede for his lost little brother. Hear me. I preach because they prayed. Who am I to preach and not pray? God's about to let this jar run over today. Is there someone right now? The spirit of prayer is upon you. And even if you don't feel the spirit of prayer, it's always good to add to this jar. Your prayer's not alone. Your prayer's not alone. You're about to see the overflow. I wonder right now if this church will let the spirit of prayer move upon you right now. I wonder if someone would travail for a prodigal. I wonder if you travail for a daughter work. I w Someone pray a vile prayer. Someone fill that jar in heaven right now. We have not because we ask not. Come on, start asking, start pleading, start praying. Your prayers are powerful. Your prayers never die. 